Grüezi and welcome to Opus 17 of Classical Cake, the podcast where we discuss topics relating to Viennese classical music and Austrian culture while enjoying a delicious cake. I'm your host, Daniel Adam Maltz. If you're new here, welcome. Click show more in the description below for more resources. Be sure to check out classicalcake.com. The Age of Enlightenment's ideals centered around the power of reason, impacted art, philosophy, politics, and music of the Baroque and Classical eras. So, in 1986, when a group of musicians created a period instrument orchestra, they thought of no better name than Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. Also known as OAE, they have worked with the world's top musicians and have grown to be one of the most well-known proponents of the historical performance movement. Today, we're meeting violinist Margaret Fulpis, co-leader of the OAE. Among many other roles, she is also head of historical performance at the Royal Academy of Music, where we'll film our socially distanced interview. Maggie, thank you for joining me. Welcome, oh, it's a great pleasure, Daniel. Our cake today is Victorian sandwich cake, an English specialty. This light dessert consists of a layer of jam and cream sandwiched between two layers of fluffy sponge cake. So, let's dig in. Well, it is quite light and quite fluffy, which is good. The jam does definitely have some real fruit in it. Yeah. It might have more cream and slightly less sugar for my taste. <laughs> um, but not bad. Very typical example, I would say, of the genre. So, Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. It's not a snappy title. No. Um, and it does actually get confused with ideas of New Age um, philosophy. Uh, so there are some confusions along the way. The name is very much centred around the idea of um, inquiry and reason and experimentation and open-mindedness rather than focusing on a particular repertoire. Although, of course, the music of... Haydn and Mozart is particularly dear to our hearts, but I see it, I see the name as meaning a spirit of inquiry rather than of a historical or geographical moment from which we spring out. I mean, in fact, we play music from Monteverdi to Mahler, at least, but the spirit of inquiry, the idea of investigation, the idea of not taking fixed opinions for granted, but investigating how and why one does anything is really the spirit uh, of the orchestra, although rather wonderfully it does imply the music of the great Viennese classicists, sure. Mozart, Haydn and Beethoven, of course. And do you find that these ideals behind the stage of enlightenment, you know, the, the reason, justice, uh, have influence on all of the music that you play? Yes. Yeah. And of course, what's interesting is that sometimes one plays a repertoire where those ideals were not necessarily the ones in the hearts and minds of the of historical composers or performers, but nevertheless, looking back through history, peeling off the layers of the onion of reception theory and practice of a lot of these great works, uh, enables us to bring the same spirit of inquiry, even if, uh, I, I imagine if the one was in Monteverdi's um, Venice, uh, not every performer was sort of allowed to have opinions there necessarily, I'm not quite sure, I'm just sort of guessing. Um, but, and certainly the orchestras wouldn't have been full of women or of um, player directors, scholar directors, but we can bring all that spirit of inquiry to, um, to everything we do really. Yeah, the idea that you're able to take the ideals from, from a type of era yeah. and, and find this good balance with today's world. We've obviously made great strides in some areas and perhaps step backwards in others, Yes, but, but perhaps there's a link between the two. Yeah, I mean we're not, certainly we're not in the business of recreating things, it's not a sealed, not society, we're not sort of playing our battles in silly costumes or anything like that. Um, we're not imagining that you can time travel back to Vienna, for example, in the uh, in the 1800s. But I think that we are interested in examining what history meant for all sorts of people. Um, I mean, it's very interesting in 2020 to look at that when we're actually considering the different histories that different groups of people have experienced over the years. I think there's 
there are clearly different histories for men than for women. There are different histories for rich people and poor people. There are different histories depending on the colour of your skin. Um, and we're very much aware of that. And I think looking at music with fresh eyes is also interesting, that we look not just with the eyes of, of the moment in history in which we are, but that we look back and see what we can bring to that. Yeah, well, it is tempting everyone who who loves old music and this and the uh, interest in historical performance and period instruments. It is tempting to sort of have a romantic longing for an era, mm. but it, it's sort of, I think, more difficult to take ideals from an era and then look at your world. Yes, I think one can look at one can certainly actually it's really worth thinking about what the historical performer might have been able to offer this music. Um, we can imagine what some of the processes were on the part of the composer if we have additional material, sketchbooks, a variety of editions, accounts of concerts, all sorts of things. So we, we think about what the composer's world might have been like. We can investigate what the performer's world was like, who performed this music, how were they educated, what was the breadth of their education and experience, and we can also, I think, consider the historical audience as well. And that produces a lot of very interesting information. I mean, there's no doubt that if one plays um, music of the first half of the 18th century that includes dance movements, no 18th century audience would have needed much introduction to what the movements were and would have understood things like tempi and affect and characterization very easily, uh, a modern audience has probably absolutely no idea, and frankly neither do some modern performers. Yeah. So trying to understand what the historical performer and historical audience at least might have known, that's not the same as imagining that you can become them and get inside their skin, but actually a knowledge of what their knowledge base was I think is extremely important and interesting for us. Again, we're not going to just replicate that because we then add our experience, our education, that old thing, you can't undo what you, you can't undo knowledge, you can't undo learning, you can't unlearn the first time one went to see Tristan and imagine that harmony had not, that harmony had not happened. Um, but we can, I think, start to learn about history from the point of view of some more ordinary people actually and not just the ordinary performer, the ordinary listener, and not just the king and the count. Sure. So, an early OAE mission statement says that the OAE aims to avoid the dangers implicit in playing as a matter of routine, pursuing exclusively commercial creative options, under rehearsal, undue emphasis as imposed by a single musical director, and recording objectives being more important than creative ones. Are these still influencing your I think, today? I think we're pretty good, actually. Um, certainly, the never doing anything as routine. You'll never find a bunch of OAA musicians who take stuff for granted and just play it. There'll always be somebody who will stand up and say, well, why are we doing that? Why have you always done that? Um, the lack of a single musical director is absolutely key. I think, to be honest, it might have been... In some ways, it's problematic for some promoters who like the peg of the famous um, conductor who runs the group, um, and we know many examples of those. Great examples, by the way, but just different. Uh, we've always wanted to invite the people we work with, whether, it, whether they're people from the modern conducting world, from the period performance world, whether they're player directors, singer directors, uh, or whether we, in fact, do a little bit of DIY, do-it-yourself directing from within the orchestra, which is also very interesting. What I'd like to say is that a lot of music, particularly from the late 18th century, early 19th century, actually is about the way certain sorts of leadership and suggestions, not of authority, but genuine leadership, is actually shared between groups of people. I think that a lot of the repertoire that's so very close to my heart at the end of the 18th century is actually demonstrating, particularly by Haydn actually, and Beethoven and Mozart to a lesser extent, ways in which collaborative leadership, invitations to comprehension and an invitation to agree or not is actually written into the music. And in an ideal world, I think that is the basis for 
harmonious relationships between people. That's why I'm so passionate about Haydn and about that, the late 18th century, is that I think, I think what those composers have done through Enlightenment philosophy yeah. is to suggest how people might behave, um, to explain that people can behave badly, but actually to explore the human condition. Um, I think Bach explores the human condition in relation to God and to things that are unknown to us. Um, but what Haydn done, doesn't tell us about how to converse with each other in the quartets, I really think is not worth, uh, not worth knowing. Yeah. So, uh, composers Handel, Mozart, Haydn, among others, uh, came to London. What was it about the cultural climate here that drew... Yeah, it was, I think it was a fantastic melting pot. Um, and it still is, in a way. So I think that there were lots of different modes of music making, of methods of music making. I think London was a, was very open-minded culturally. Um, I don't know whether that's something about the English language. Um, I mean, we certainly weren't bereft of music. The, the land without music, I think, is really not appropriate. Um, but there, was a, there were a lot of different musics going on. There were, it was a, there were a lot of entrepreneurs, it was a big city. Uh, it welcomed people from all over the world. Uh, yeah, a real melting pot, I think. Um, and the spirit of adventure, you could have not one theatre, but there'd be two or three competing with each other. And a little bit of competition is never a bad thing, yeah. as we know. Sure. As you mentioned before, the OAE has worked with conductors and musicians known for working primarily with modern instruments, such as, you know, Sir Simon Rattle and Andres Schiff. Uh, what came from these sort of cross-genre collaborations? It's been really fantastic. I mean, I think people like Sir Simon Rattle, Sir Mark Elder, um, Vladimir Yarovsky, Sir Charles McCarris. I mean, the list is big. I'm going to forget people, I'm sure. Andrew Davis. A lot of people with whom we worked at Glyndebourne have been absolutely key in the development of the orchestra because they also, they did give us a sort of contemporary and modern orchestral training that we didn't have as a bunch of freelancers. So I think there's, we, there's been a lot of cross-fertilisation. Um, there were all sorts of people who were living and working in Europe um, and without having a single director here, we, we felt we were all broadening our horizons by inviting these people over. And, and of course, not everybody's ideas about music and particular repertoires appeal to everybody, but I think the answer is we just always, always embraced what it was, what we got on offer. We often worked with these directors in a bunch of single string players to go through repertoire to talk about 19th century performance style uh, at a time when ideas about 19th century performance were really new, about how we could bring the technology of the instruments and the, the playing techniques that came with that technology um, and ex in, it, it used that to inform our playing and indeed for modern composers, modern, um, sorry, and for modern conductors to be able to hear what that sounded like and to realise that the composers were pushing those instruments absolutely to their limits a lot of the time, and so were we, sure. and experimenting. Um, that was really like stepping back in history a little bit, I suppose, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, hearing well, things for the first time again. The OED puts a massive emphasis on education, which is, of course, very much in line with this ideal of the yes. Enlightenment. Uh, you worked extensively with schools, performed in non traditional venues such as pubs, and created many. You know, online videos and assets. How have these efforts benefited your audiences? Um, I think I'm hoping that there will be new audiences and younger audiences. Uh, music education in England is at an absolutely perilous state mm -hmm. with the lack of provision in primary schools, that's the first sort of schools, and I think a lot of professional orchestras just see that if they don't do it, it will just not happen at all. Uh, we're now resident, our offices are now at a large inner London comprehensive school called Acton Burley. Uh, and the staff there, the headmaster in particular, has embraced this move 
uh, and we're already looking at projects not only with the music department but with art, with science, with literature, mm -hmm. with history, just about with dance, with everything you can think of. And it just shows that I think that the arts and culture need to embrace this idea of education with a capital E. Um, I think some of the online videos have received sort of two and a half million views now, which is just fantastic. Um, I think it sounds like, it sounds pompous to say that music needs to educate, but I think, I, I think our nature as human beings is to be musical. I think all human beings are musicians. And I think actually we really, it is a sort of birthright to have some exposure to that. And maybe not, education is a rather sort of prescriptive word, but I think everybody has the right to have the musician inside them brought out. So I'm particularly interested in one thing, this, what's called the night shift. Could you tell us a little bit about this? You had this, don't you? The night shift, uh, yeah, that's one of my favourite things, um, except we can't do them now because pubs are closed. Mm -hmm. um, again, it was an idea of exploring a different demographic, um, a different venue from what are basically traditionally 19th century concert halls where you turn up like you do in church, you behave like you do in church, you sit back, something happens, sort of miles ahead of you, everybody looks like a waiter in a penguin suit, um, and there's often a white man with a stick, apparently, telling everybody what to do. Um, and that's only one small snapshot of what music can be. And in terms of sort of socialising and re-socialising uh, classical music, there are lots of small gig venues in London pubs uh, where many people uh, under the age of 30 hang out and go and hear sets of music, not long sort of concerts. And it just occurred to a bunch of people in the office one day that there would be no reason why those gig venues in pubs shouldn't have some classical music. And actually it was our orchestral fix, I think, who came up with the idea of it calling it the night shift. And I never forget the first one, being asked to do a pilot. It was very clear it was only a pilot, because everybody thought, well, we no idea how this would play off. Um, we went up the road from the then offices near King's Cross Station, and I put together about a 45 minute set, which is quite a lot of music. Yeah. We played Purcell, and we played some of the most esoteric Pavans and Fantasias than you could imagine, plus some Jolly Chacons and a few of the dance movements from Fairy Queen. But the thing, I don't know, now looking back, I think, why did I dare do that? But what for me was completely life changing was the quality of the listening when we were playing the most painful dissonances and the quietest, slow-moving Pavans and Fantasias. Because the audience were much closer together than you and I, well, no, certainly no social distancing when we began this experiment um, over a decade ago. But it didn't matter what the music was, clearly what people heard and experienced and felt, it was a felt sense, was that they were as much part of the performance as the performers were. It was quieter than I've ever heard the Woodmore Hall, even though we were all packed together in this sort of small room, and it was packed. Um, and the quality of the dissonances and the harmony in the Purcell, the, the pained interrelationship with the physics, if you like, of the music, was tangible. It was, you, you could feel it in the air and you could hear it and feel it in people's listening and I was absolutely blown away. I have never performed that music anywhere else that's had the effect that it has when we play it in pubs. Mm -hmm. and the best thing is when we just simply go in there and play our music and explain it and don't attempt to make it into a comedy show or dumb it down. Yeah. Um, I'm very clear about that. Thanks Maggie for sharing this classical cake with me. Thank you very much. We should finish the cake now, Daniel. Yeah, we should. <laughs> and thanks to you listeners for tuning in. If you learned something new, then please share this podcast with your friends. If you haven't already, then please subscribe. I'm Daniel Adam Maltz. See you in Vienna. Auf Wiedersehen. Wiedersehen.